Interesting. Okay. Here we go. Teaching is analogous personalization, a pragmatic inquiry into the expert teacher's process for fostering synchrony and educational dialogues in post-secondary writing. I want to preface this by saying that like, most of us in this room are educators, and so I'm not really planning on telling you anything you don't already know. I'm just going to try and talk about something that's kind of hard to prove or trace. And so I, that's the last seven to eight years of my life I've been figuring out how to trace this. So let's start with why. How do good teachers do what they do? The teachers that you remember, the ones whose lessons have become part of the way that you look at and interact with the world, how did they move you that deeply? Was it uh, because somebody handed them a recipe of best practices and that worked for them? Or were they, were they just born that way? Did they pop out of the womb loving microeconomics and knowing how to capture your attention and spark your understanding at 10 a.m. in a classroom full of 30 students? It's doubtful. So, when I think back on my best teachers, a lot of them just confounded the great teacher stereotype. They were soft-spoken, socially awkward, like clearly poor joke writers, and their, their practices in another person's hands might have been horrifying, right? Making fun of students, telling long-winded stories, even just engaging in impromptu discussions about the material with us. So how did they do it? When I look back at what all of these teachers had in common, the one thing that stuck out in my head was their sincerity. They seemed real and connected with their work and with their students in the classroom. So I told my advisor, I want to study teacher sincerity. And he said, how do you operationalize that? And so that was my challenge. What is teacher sincerity? How does it form and develop as a teacher becomes an expert? And why does it matter? Can a student learn just as easily from a computer program or from a technician running point by point precisely through a pre-developed curriculum? Answering that begins with understanding basically what it needs to learn and to share knowledge as a human being. So that was where I started. Um, science has shown us some really important fundamental things about human beings and how they learn and share knowledge. So one is that learning is natural. It's something that you're going to do, no matter what. Broadly speaking, learning is change, and we're always changing. In an ecological view, human beings are in a constant dialogue with their environment. It is shaping you, and you are shaping it, in a series of mutually consequential transitions. Second, learning is something you're meant to do with other people. Look at my face. You are keying in on whatever it is that I'm looking at, and trying to form a theory about what I think and feel about this thing that I'm looking at. I'm sorry for objectifying. And you've been doing that since you were an infant and four years old, respectively. And third, learning is individual. To really learn something well means integrating it into the way you see and make sense of and interact with the world. Basically, when they study expertise, expertise boils down to pattern recognition. It's collecting this vast experiential knowledge base and then finding patterns within these situations and then using that to form a more general knowledge framework that you use to quickly respond to these situations. But what's really important to remember is that these general knowledge frameworks are not gray and abstract. They are based in your sensory experience, they are fueled by your emotions, and you make sense of them reflectively by incorporating them into your biography. And what that is essentially saying is your richest understandings are always going to be deeply individualized. They're connecting together who you were, what you think you are right now, and what you're imagining you're going to become. So these basic realities have important implications in schools. One, learning is polyphasic. When learners are learning, they're always learning more than one thing at a time. Part of that may be the lesson that you intended, but they're also going to be learning a ton of other information. Everything from uh, the teacher's tone, to the classroom structure, to the social atmosphere is going to be teaching them things. Second, learning is polycontextual, meaning that learners are coming into an environment as community members of their families, of their churches, of their friend groups, and they have learned lessons in each of these contexts that they're bringing with them. So they're not just a student in the classroom. And they're trying to incorporate, how is this classroom like my last experience? How is it different? Who am I supposed to be in this situation? And how do I get what I want out of that exchange? And third, learning is persuasive. 
When you think about the integrated way that emotions, thoughts, and motivations work together as a learner learns, all of those things are involved every time they look at an assignment and say, what is worth looking at, what is worth thinking about, and putting effort into here. These things all work together. And when you think about that, this makes an educational leader fundamentally important in learning. Uh, Lawrence Kremen says that education is the deliberate, systematic, and sustained effort to transmit, evoke, or, or acquire knowledge, attitudes, values, skills, sensibilities. I want to focus here on the sustained effort that's deliberate, right? It is an intentional and persuasive act. And so, if you want education to work like that, you have to, like that requires more than the monologic telling of instruction. This sort of like skill running and skill testing of learn this, say this, do this, and let me watch that and tell you if you did it correctly. It takes that uh, dialogic coordination of teaching, which is that step-by-step -step personal process of shaping a lesson and guiding attention, right? So not just saying do this, but try this, look at this, Think about this. Do you understand? Is this making sense to you? Is this helping? Those kind of interactions stimulate deeper change in people beyond their rote performance on skills. This is the kind of teaching that uh, gets people to connect material with their own lives, to expand their awareness and values, and to transform in their characters. So looking at education in this dialogic way as a complexly personal, situated, and motivated exchange can become a really important tool for looking at classroom exchanges and figuring out why one situation works and another one fails given very similar content and very similar methods. Why does one work? Why does the other not? And fields like writing studies that take a rhetorical and pragmatic view to education end up being really valuable here because they highlight with, with this sort of rhetorical approach why the social emotional foundations matter for academic outcomes. The traditional mindset of rhetoric is that effective communication incorporates both conveying an understanding of material or sparking that understanding in someone else and also persuading them of that position's value. Uh, and that is very helpful for orienting us as teachers and as researchers toward the dialogic challenges in schools. One of them is crossing thresholds that learners sometimes have to undergo really intense changes in their worldviews and habits in order to uh, orient to another discipline. And teachers can help this by recognizing that their classrooms do have these threshold concepts, these things that are alien to a student's understanding, and by creating dialogues where students are stepping into those ways of thinking and thinking like that. Uh, another dialogic challenge in schools is this idea of fostering dispositions. And that's the idea that in order for a student to use their material beyond the classroom, they need to, to understand that use outside of the classroom context. And this, again, is something that teachers can nurture in dialogue by changing things from answer finding, what's the thing that I want you to understand, to problem exploring, like, let's look at this issue, how can, we, how can we solve it, or what can we do about it? And then also creating space within these lessons for students to apply these ideas in different situations. A third thing that it helps us to focus in on is respecting student agency. Thinking about the fact that students' roles in school as the student, right? There is the teacher and there is the one who studies under it. And these sort of um, performative definitions of success can really limit students' feeling of purpose and power in an educational exchange. And also lead to overlooking the very creative ways that they sometimes apply this knowledge. And again, teachers can support students owning and integrating their knowledge by recognizing students' agency, looking for the underlying sense in the things that they offer up, and offering genuine opportunities for them to take a leadership role, make executive decisions, all of the things that actually foster expertise when you're learning. So, in a nutshell, educational dialogues are personal, practical, and principled, and learning how to lead them as a teacher takes a lot of time, effort, and reflection. So that's the focus of my study. How do expert teachers come to their personal, practical, principled understandings of educational dialogues? Um, I'm gonna take a drink right now because my teeth are sticking to my mouth. <laughs> So that was the big general theory, right? What learning is, the implication that has for school, and why a dialogic approach to that 
is very useful for looking at how classroom exchanges work and why some of them fail and some of them succeed when all these other technical elements seem similar. Uh, the theory that I used going into this is basically two ideas, uh, and they are both representing a synthesis of these scientific and rhetorical observations about human learning. One is that the pragmatic goal of teaching is analogous personalization. And this is the idea that a teacher, informed by their own learning experiences and valued understandings, guides students through their own learning experiences towards similar, uniquely personal understandings. Analogous personalization. I really like this image as a representation of it. You know, this woman who has carved this magical hand and this child who has carved this magical hand. And it looks similar, but they're both reflections of the person's own experience. The second one is that the pragmatic means, you know, toward this analogous personalization, the means of that is dialogue. And that's the idea that teachers and students trade social signals, whether that's direct or mediated, implicit or explicit, verbal or nonverbal, about their internal emotions, thoughts, and motives. And this is a foundation for developing shared attitudes, beliefs, and intentions. So, that's, that's the focus. Here's what I did. My research questions are essentially tracing the pragmatic arc of a, of a course, of any educational exchange. Starting with the teacher's intention, how do experienced successful teachers describe and organize their practical approaches to teaching? The next step along that path is the social foundations. So what do the social foundations of those academic exchanges between teachers and students look like? And then, after we've gone from that intention to those social foundations, what are the educational outcomes that come out of that, that exchange between an experienced teacher and the students they're working with and trying to work towards some educational goal? Um, basically, I, I explored these uh, questions using two approaches. One, observation-grounded inquiry. That means I sit down in a classroom like this. Uh, my goal was usually to sit at 90 degrees so that I could watch the teacher teaching and the student studenting and watch the interaction between them. I took notes on that and then I sat down with the teachers and students and talked about what their experience of that was because I don't know what's going on inside their heads. So, observation grounded inquiry. And the second one is discourse analysis, which is that I then transcribed a lot of these conversations and interactions that were going on in the classroom and then in my interviews with them about what they were thinking and reflecting on about these and trying to find that story of what the teacher intended, what actually happened in that social space, and what the educational takeaway was from that exchange. Uh, specifically, my first point of inquiry, this is getting inside the teacher's head, this is about intention, so I wanted to map out the teacher's personal, practical, principled intentions. On that first note, the personal, uh, I asked them about this class, and I asked them to get concrete about the course that they were currently teaching. And this was to sort of warm up their brains to how they're interacting with these students, and I was looking for the personal foundation in that. So I coded for things like, I am, I love, I hate, I try, I do. Teaching is. And then I also marked off portions where they broke into reenacting the classroom dialogues as a way of explaining these things about what they believed and the, the kind of teaching that they were trying to do on top of that. I used that to create a very rough style and content key. What is their, what is their rhetorical style of justifying and explaining their teaching? And what are the underlying beliefs, values, emotions that are moving that forward? So that was the personal. Uh, then the practical, I asked them about their context. What kind of student were you? Uh, were there any teachers that you borrowed from? What, what kinds of things have you learned from interacting with students? And this was just me listening to the stories and hearing what was positive and negative. I hate when teachers do this. I, I was really moved by when teachers did this. And that gave me an, uh, an image of the biographical context within which they were creating these personalized approaches to teaching. And then there was the practical, which was where I gave them a list of 21 teaching-related terms that I, I put together and then refined based on the three teachers that I was studying. Uh, and this was to sort of get a sense of how they were organizing this experiential knowledge base, right? this practical experiential knowledge base about teaching into a framework, a generalized framework that they could then apply in their classrooms. Um, and so in this, I coded for semantic links, looking for if they were making, using similar examples to talk about a thing. I'm like, oh, that kind of connects them or if uh, they were defining terms similarly, I was like, okay, that gets a little closer. Or if they actually said something, you know, like, to me, uh, improvisation is really a big part of humor. Yeah. Then I would say, great, that's an explicit link, and I'll put them together. And based on that, I built out 
these maps of how each of them sort of creates a generalized framework about their teaching. My second point of inquiry, so now that was the teacher's intention, personal, practical, principled approach to teaching. The second part is describing a teacher's and student's classroom relationships. So now we actually drop into an actual classroom, out of the teacher's head, into the classroom, looking at human beings interacting. Again, in a personal, practical, principled way. So the data I collected from this was, again, interviews with the teachers, specifically focusing in on this thing I did called the performance attachment grid, where I gave the teachers a list of their students and said, where, uh, where would you place these students? on a list from high to low performing, on a list from closely aligning to challenging you socially. Uh, and then with the students, I gave them surveys where I asked them a, like way too many, a slew of questions. But fortunately, fortunately they answered most of them. Uh, and so the first part was the persons in practice. I wanted to see who these people were in the classroom. Uh, and so for this, I combined teachers self-describing their classroom presence, what kind of a person you are in the classroom, and uh, where they place students on a grid. I combine that with students talking about how the teacher was as a person in the classroom, uh, and survey responding to things like what the teacher thinks of you, personality and teaching style, how it feels to talk with them, teachers' apparent beliefs and values, and if the teacher were an animal. Right, so, which I found really useful, right? So this is V, for instance, is a monkey, chimp, rabbit, easily distracted dog, turtle, wise rat like the Ninja Turtles. You can, you can contrast that with how they described M, which was a T-Rex, Velociraptor, and a Liger, a combination of a lion and tiger, right? So, so you're getting a real clear sense of how the teacher understands the students through that performance attachment grid, and how the students respond to the teacher as a human being. The next step was looking at the practical and the personal. So the teachers and students as as people who are working together within a course, how they're working toward those educational ends. For this, I combined how the teacher described the class progress and the challenges toward reaching their learning objectives with how students described the teacher's support for their learning. So this is really important that I, I dissected or like um, isometrically separated uh, how the students felt about the teacher as a social presence versus how they felt about them as someone who was helping their learning along. And so these were things like, what is the teacher's delivery like, and how is this class? And so I had them rate these on Likert scales of you know, how offensive was it, how entertaining, how conversational. And this gave me an image of how they work together toward course aims. The third part was looking at the principles in practice. And this, by this I mean, why are you there in this classroom? So for this, I combined the teachers describing their core educational aims for the course, when you get to the end of this course, what do you want students to have taken away? And I combine that with students describing the teacher's educational aims for them, like what does the teacher want you to get out of this course? And also, their own personal reasons for taking the course, which is really important, because when you talk about their personal reasons for taking it, it's things like, you needed to fill a general education requirement, it's a prereq, all of these, like they're in the classroom, not all because they're in love with writing. And this really highlights the fact that teaching is this persuasive endeavor, because that's not what the teacher's about, right? They're not saying, I'm in this classroom to make sure that people's, people get all their GE requirements filled. They're saying, I want them to learn something about the value of this writing for them as thinkers and as people out in the world. And so that becomes this image of why the teachers and students are there together working in the classroom. Um, and then my third point of inquiry, so we have the intention, we have the social foundations, and now we have the, the pragmatic arc of the course that plays out on top of that, what the learning progress is. And so that starts with the persons in practice, defining the educational environment, and so for this, I traced reliable patterns in the teacher's style and manner. I started off with my ethnographic field notes and said, what are things that these teachers are doing over and over again that sort of defines their course and what students can come to rely on and expect in that course. Um, Second, I looked at the practical and the personal, tracing the maturing dialogues within that environment. So the teacher's doing this, they're interacting in this way, creating this environment, the students are responding in this way. What kind of conversations are coming out of that? And then the third was looking at what the educational takeaway was. By the end of the course, how are these conversations different than they were at the beginning? What has happened? Where has this gone? So those were my basic, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of data, 
<laughs> but, but, uh, but that's essentially what I was looking at. So what did I find? What did I learn about how expert teachers do what they do? So let's go back to my three questions. One, teacher intention. How do experienced successful teachers describe and organize their practical approaches to teaching? Uh, the answer is essentially like experts. They have vast experiential knowledge bases, which they've distilled into simple seeming heuristics that support a quick ability to recognize patterns and formulate responses in educational dialogues. So within the 21 terms, it was really interesting to see that these were, so these are just some of the realizations that they came up with. They had many uh, similar realizations about what teaching in a writing classroom was. But really importantly, they were organized idiosyncratically, meaning that all three of them mentioned on their own without any prompting. This class is, is improvisation. Every class is improvisation. The course cyclically revisits basic lessons. Like these were all things that they mentioned. But the way that they organized them in when, when I mapped it out was idiosyncratic. So this is that was B, this is B, and this is M. And you can see that whereas V had everything oriented away from uh, in-class correction, just like, please, anything that doesn't stress the students out, B was all about creating this student-centered learning atmosphere and modeling questions, and M is essentially everything away from apathy. Just be credible, be sincere, test people, be, in, be involved in the class. And so they were all arranged around distinct values-based priorities and grounded in experience, uh, experience patterns from their own educational dialogues. And so this is just a sample of my field notes from the classroom. And even though I have not described these teachers very much, all, already I hope this is, you can recognize, this is not something that all three teachers would say. This is something that only the student, like this teacher, would ever say. I want you to underline this in your blood. Right? And having conversations with students like that gives you a distinct experience-based pattern of what educational dialogues in a classroom are. Because if you don't talk like that, you don't have students responding in the way that students would respond to this. So we have three upper division writing courses with three very distinct uh, philosophies. So for me, it was a friendly, humor-laden, see-one-do-one approach. For B, it was a student-centered, feedback-driven, exploring and growing approach. And for M, it was a stringent, professional, hard, self-described, hard-ass approach. And when you look at the justifications for this, V's, V has very rational, logical justifications for the way that he teaches this course, which is that students get terrorized by teachers and stressed out by academic environments at the college level. So please, let's bring some balance to the force. But when you, when you then explore his answers, they are based on these personal foundations of his childhood struggles with strict religious teachers and his sort of renaissance when he got to grad school of this warm bath of, of a person uh, saying, oh, please, come in, and, like, welcome to the conversation. And so that became the foundation for his personal determination to make writing courses relaxing and enjoyable experiences for the students. When we look at B's justifications for her student-centered feedback-driven course, again, very rational. Educational research findings back up that like this is the way that we can help students learn. Also, I have a background in character education, teaching the whole person. So she had very, very reasonable justifications for her approaches. But she also had these personal foundations of when I was a kid, people stifled my creativity. And then when I got to college, I was part of this rebellious 60s peer culture, and that was where I really grew. And this teaching was a part of this larger context of my personal environment, and I was bringing that into the classroom. So I want to make sure that my classroom is the same. It's full of where students can explore and define their creativity and also feel like their peer group doesn't disappear when they walk into this classroom. It's a part of it. And then finally, when we look at M's stringent, professional, hard-ass approach, again, a very reasonable justification. Students want to know what the rules are, and they need preparation for the real world. He said the worst thing you can do is send a student out into the world saying, like, I've had a good time partying, and now I have no preparation for the real world. Very reasonable justification, but he has personal foundations for this, which is that as a student, he never really saw himself as an intelligent or valuable person until teachers forced him to speak, and spent time critiquing him in a way that made him feel like he was worth that time and attention and effort. And so that became his push for lighting the same fire under these quiet, brilliant students that are sitting in his classrooms. The second point 
social foundations. What do uh, the social foundations of these expert teachers, academic exchanges with students look like? So the answer, life reflections of their personal experience-based values. When I looked at the, the 21 terms, I found this recurring pattern, especially within the terms that had the longest responses with the most reenacted dialogues, where they would break out and say, well, I'm trying to define this, con this concept within my general knowledge framework abstractly, but it's not working, so let me drop down and just reenact what classrooms look like for a second. And so what I saw within that was that teachers would describe fundamentally similar challenges. For example, with friendship, they would all mention that like, this is a tricky thing that you're, when you're sort of negotiating uh, what your relationship is with your students. Uh, they would have uh, fundamentally similar challenges, but they would frame those challenges within those personal dictionaries that I talked about, those, that the 21 words sort of helps you to visually recognize. Uh, and that, that they would then conclude after filtering these similar challenges through their own personal dictionaries with seemingly divergent attitudes and protocols. So in this case, when we have friendship, V really focuses in on this is not a sanctuary from classroom uh, obligations. And that's coming from, from him constantly getting students who say, oh yeah, this chummy, friendly, humorous thing, like what can I get away with? And so he's like, okay, I have to make sure I put down a hard line there. With B, it's natural. It's not the goal, but it comes out of just relating to students as a human being. And that comes out of her person-centered, whole person approach to the classroom, where you know, she has students who will come up and open up to her, and then over time that creates this relationship. And then M said, after the class is over, right? Because again, he's strict, he's, he, he draws these lines, and so he's like, after the class is over, but then he starts fudging them. He's like, you know, I won't go to the movies with them, but these students asked me to go and watch them at their concert, so of course, I've cleared my schedule, I'm gonna go and watch them at the concert. And what's interesting is, student descriptions of the classroom learning environments synchronously reflected each teacher's priorities and intentions. So, for example, consensus on the surveys in V's course really pointed toward things that he saw as central, which is modeling enjoyment, drawing in participation, and creating a relaxed and engaged learning environment. In uh, interpretations of spoken and written feedback, so for example, when I was, I was doing stimulated recall interviews with some of the students in B's class, and I found this comment on the paper, you have one more chance to get this correct. And I was like, ooh, I want to ask you about this, because there are so many ways that a student could take that scrawled across a paper with a big exclamation point on a paper. And the student said, if it was another teacher, it would be different, but she's very friendly and approachable, and you can definitely tell she's not out to get anyone. So I wasn't worried about that comment. I guess it was funny. I definitely would have thought of her saying it with a smile on the face, right? So a constructive, supportive, community learning mindset is what she's aiming for, and that's what I was hearing the students channeling when I was talking to them about their reflections about the class. And for M, the responses to his in-class challenges, the no, you're wrong, explain yourself, the what's that, uh, right? The way that they respond to that showed an understanding and appreciation of his intention, right? Which is that they said, I don't feel that he makes you feel like, oh gosh, I don't ever want to speak again. Like he's not pushing you down, he's making you want to say, well shoot, what's the right answer? And the other one's like, yeah, it's like I want to get it right and then like throw it in his face. And, and these are all so focusing on that, that intention that he has to treat students as intellectual equals and to prepare them for the rigors of life and work environments. My third question, educational outcomes. How do educational dialogues progress socially and intellectually over the arc of a course in these expert teachers' classrooms? Oh, what was my point? The answer, gradually and intentionally toward moments of synchrony. That, that's important because we're heading towards synchrony. That's my big thing. Uh, and, so, and the point I want to make here is that viewing classroom dialogues as I'm doing through the teacher's own values framework and students' own learning experiences as opposed to some predefined external model. Looking at it through their own frameworks really helps to highlight where and how synchrony is developing between teachers and students in educational exchanges. For example, these students describe getting excited about their writing and confident in analyzing media through their own critical lenses rather than someone else's theories. That's exactly what he wanted to have happen. 
B students described letting go of some writing activities and embracing others that were, and finding a way that worked for them among the different options that she was presenting. And that's exactly what she was intending. M students described saying, you know what, this class was really hard and this guy was a real asshole to me, but it left me really confident about my writing and my ability to take criticism. And that's exactly what M was hoping for. I got, there were students describing how they can, they can go out and how much joy they were having correcting their friends on their writing. That their friends would say, hey, look at this. They'd say, oh, this is wrong. You have nominalizations. You have a dangling modifier. And they're like, it's so fun to do that now. And I wouldn't have been able to do it if he hadn't been kicking my butt for a, a whole quarter. So, so now we get to the, the question of sincerity that I started with which is, through the eyes of expert teachers and their students, how does sincerity contribute to achieving the synchrony in educational exchanges, that coordinated alignment of feelings, thoughts, and motives toward a learning goal? So there are a pair of answers. For the teachers, when I ask them about sincerity, it's a driving force for the consistency in their practice, their emotional presence, their critical attention, and their constant reflection, which is the path to their expertise all that stuff that the students were impressed with. And then for the students, that same sort of full dedication to the classroom, that heart-mind-body dedication translates to feeling that the teacher is personally trustworthy, that they are credible in practice, and that they are someone that you can respect as an educational leader. And anyway, those are quotes. So st students walk into these classrooms relaxed because their teachers give them nothing to fear. They walk in prepared to think because they know that their teachers will be really listening to them. And they walk in confident because when a leader somehow knows the answer to a question before you do, it takes the pressure off. And it gives you a sense like you really honestly belong in that classroom learning environment. So that's, that's my dissertation. Thank you.